outline of the exhibition of the 15 years of Tobias's artistic work that the exhibition looks at. We are again here in the introductory gallery that gives an overview of what Tobias has done and an introduction to some of the specific chapters that the other three rooms in the exhibition um, pick up. The first room, and that's I think the way we also want to start the talk today, also looks at Tobias's transition from architect to artist. And so I just asked you about that. How did you become an artist? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, thanks for coming today. Um, it's quite a nicely filled room, not too filled due to our recent outbreaks again. Um, so the question is a, would be a very, very long answer, but maybe I'll try to break it down a bit. So I was, uh, I am a trained architect. I went through an architecture training in three countries. Uh, first, a very modern and technical training in the uh, Technical University in Aachen, which was where Mies van der Rohe came from. It was a very uh, prestigious, but very, you could say to a certain degree, conservative, certainly very practice and technical oriented. So the teaching in architecture there relies a lot on engineering. And from then I moved on to the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. And that's already a hybrid part, which of course uh, values uh, technical knowledge and the ability to construct things. But in the, in the three master classes at that time, one by, um, and the one that I went in by was Briggs from Himmelblau, uh, the idea of architecture being a balancing art plot, art, art, artifice, Künstlichkeit, or a form of artistic landscape as well, uh, played a huge role. And um, I finished my studies then in the, um, in the Bartlett School for Architecture at UCL London. Uh, and there certainly the technical knowledge that I gained before came to fruition because in the last part, it was not that much anymore about being able to technically articulate whether something holds up or so but more being able to think beyond the borders of what traditional architecture is like. So that can be often to a negative or to a, to a good idea to be a front end designer or architect coming up with new ideas. Um, so in, in some way I would say these, these three universities in three countries with three different approaches to, to, the, to the teaching of architecture, the conveying of it, they laid a bit of the foundation of why I was able to change. And I think already my master thesis, which I, I'll show some images you're seeing it behind you next to the Cologne Cathedral. I'll show this as well online. So my, my master thesis of that um, this is a, a drawing of it, and you're seeing it here, the 3 d printed this out there. Uh, of course, it's still parts of being of architecture quality, uh, kind of resembles a facade element, but it's already based on the 3D scanning of bones and such. And it's already a state where you would say in a traditional university, it might get very tricky to actually get your master of it, because it's already quite in between where art and architecture meets or where maybe art or architecture once was before the great divide in engineering and architecture. So this is as well a image of that. So on, online I'm showing the same image that you're seeing actually in real here. So you are much more privileged to see the real color. And from that obviously there's the problem in architecture then that we make things. So um, architects, don't build buildings. That's a famous thing to say, but it's actually true. Builders build buildings. Architects draw buildings. They conceive an idea about a building. They make tiny drawings in comparison to large drawings, but in comparison to the real building, they're actually very small. Um, so quite often to convey an idea, architects tend to build models. 
And that's already now a very tricky conversation because some models are very elaborate, uh, imitate material, and some are ideal models, very abstract models, and some become very realistic models in terms of really imitating the green grass and so on. I never built a realistic type of, but I was obviously often interested in building these things that they were called models to be a representation of something that there is there to come. So that places the architect already very close to, I would say, a sculptor or an artist to a certain degree of, because of the outcome that is on the table. The type of materials might be very similar. Doesn't mean that the attitude is the same or the intention behind it, because the model usually conveys an idea of the larger building to be built. But they are quite close to each other. There's not too much difference uh, from the object. There's a lot of difference from where, where it comes from. So the first type of models that really bridge that gap is one that we can't show you because it's well, just not in my possession anymore. But the model that you see here of the work that first really transgressed that boundary is in a very strange state is this paper model laser cut where there's a 3D printed structure there which is based on an MRI scan of my heart. But at the same time, it's an architectural model to scale from the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral done by Sir Christopher Wren. That model actually sold for a lot of money at the Royal uh, Academy Summer Show in 2008. And that was a very strange thing, that a collector of art by the architectural model in which he saw something else in. Now that certainly wasn't the idea why I should start doing art for selling stuff because that's really not a very valuable, I mean, can work or not, but that was not the intention. But something strange happened in that the conversation around this, what was for me already transgressive, what is it? It's a, it's a model to a scale of a cathedral. There is an MRI heart in there, which clearly really is how this position with these rays are is taking the iconography of some of Christian's more sexual uh, posts, like the open heart of Jesus, and all this kind of like imagery of heart and embodiment and icon. Um, into, a, into a very strange level. That is, you cannot say that this is a model in the architectural world, but you cannot say it is sculpture, you cannot. But so it's already an in between state between the two. Depending on if you're an architect, you say, oh, well, that's a really interesting take on Sir Christopher's when uh, Sir Christopher Wren's um, St. Paul's Cathedral, or if you want to see it as a sculpture, then it's a sculpture with an architectural content maybe, of scale or of the body in scale to the ecclesial body, to the spiritual body of the church as an architecture. And um, so taking this, there was one, one moment then as well where the playing with materials and with found objects, that kind of nesting of here in the model collapsed into the nesting of uh, works that were on, built on found objects. So these kind of strange little things here, they are about 15 years old now, are really the first attempt where a uh, found strange cultural object, both these bones were actually found on the graveyard in Havana, the uh, necropolis de Cristobal Colon, which is a graveyard, center of Havana. I went there on a study trip. And um, it's a place where lots of cultures meet and clash and collapse. Um, Havana being then 19, no, that's 2005, kind of in the in-between state of a communist governed country and not, or maybe still all a bit of a mess. Definitely under heavy um, economic embargoes. The past of it was actually more interesting to me because it, it's a city where you have syncretic religions, meaning religions that are made from multiple paths. In that case, usually Christian belief systems and African Yoruban belief systems that were clashed during the, well, the, the, the slave trade, uh, which settled in, in Cuba. So you have on the Christian graveyard strange, or not strange, but local rituals that involve, for instance, animal sacrifice, where you have a lot of bones just lying around. On top of that, that graveyard is a closed space. It has walls and has a very limited amount of uh, great design. So the local custom was as well to actually be buried only for two years. 
and then the body gets taken out, and another body gets put into the same grave with the same name on it. So the names became as well irrelevant. Only for a certain amount of time. So the, the whole place was a catalyst of changing an idea about what a model of something is, and not only an architecture model, but a way of thinking about objects, things, and systems. So these became, in a way, the catalysts of my early artistic practice in terms of shifting an idea of something is a representation, what the architecture model is, to something where the attachment, the transfer of these values and narratives of found objects could lead to something that you would um, characterize more like, for instance, a relic. And these are super powerful objects, relics, because they allow you to project all kinds of values onto simple objects, like bones or a little bit of uh, garment or any other things that you can find, usually enshrined in a lot of gold and diamonds and other things to make it look more valuable. But they are incredibly powerful objects. And they started to really fascinate me on the level of like where do certain masses are combined and where do uh, certain materials are combined. So in that case as well, a 3D printed material that is not a material, uh, or I mean it is a material in the classical sense, but for us to appreciate it as some sort of narrative material is almost impossible because it comes from plastic granulum or something else and it seems to be still in the architectural representation of something instead of being the actual material. So that kind of tension, that field of tension is really where, where the shift happens that I was not any more interested in building the big building at this point in time, but figuring out that vacillating object that once was a model and now is something else. I don't know that. And this transition then from architectural model, so a small model in a different material that doesn't represent the building, but is a smaller version in a different material thereof, to the 3D printed sculpture that you do, yeah. that is really the massive shift I think that really characterizes your work that the printed resin is elevated to an artist's material and we can speak about mm. more about that maybe later but mm -hmm. juxtaposing that to the glass um, but that brings me really to that question when when were you introduced to glass mm. how did you combine um, the two materials and, and thereby also the traditional and digital craftsmanship that we discuss in this exhibition. Yeah. Um, well, we place these, these works here next to each other. So this is the 2005 works with the bones and the 3D printed material. Those two little things. These are just um, lower versions of that. And then 12 years passed, and what you see on this table is pretty much 12 years, and in the vitrines of things trying out and material studies trying out. Uh, but working a lot on that initial complex question of like, so what, what is then this really printed as a material? Is it a substrate for crystal growing? Or is it a, a standalone strange thing that is half digital and half physicalized somehow? And in 2017, so 12 years later, I made them the second work here, I'll show this as well on, uh, on the um, share screen here. Right, it's not this. Yes, so I made these, these objects here. And this was in uh, Pilchuk School for Glass. It's a, it's a glass school in America. Uh, about an hour, two hours drive from Seattle in the forest around the uh, well, Pacific Northwest Wilderness, you could call it. Um, I was invited as an artist in residence based on my work with different materials and uh, some of the ideas that I had established by then. I came to Hong Kong in 2014, so Hong Kong was another major shift in things. So I had established maybe a very, very initial art practice, uh, artist practice, being in Hong Kong, being in the School of Creative Media, when this email came in, do you want to go to Pilchard's class school as an artist in residence? So my initial reaction was to answer the email with, uh, I have no idea about glass, why should I go? I mean, why do you want me to be in a class school? It makes no sense. And then I, I was on the phone and with, with uh, Tina O'Fieri, who was then the director of the Pilchard's 
last year, and she explained to me that the particular reason for them to invite actually entrepreneurs is to invite people who have no idea about glass to work with glass craftsmen. So to actually start to have a dialogue, start to have an exchange of ideas and methods that otherwise the glass community in itself would maybe not do, or the artistic community would not do. So it's uh, a mutual exchange, mutual beneficial for both of them, for the artists to get introduced to glass making and maybe, maybe make that part of their practice. And for the glass craftsmen actually to be exposed to complete impossible, crazy, or in a non-feasible or maybe very interesting ideas that could actually benefit their craftsmanship practice as well. So at first, before arriving there, and I, I purposefully did not watch a hundred videos on YouTube about glass blowing or so and trying to know something about it really before coming there, thinking that I could show off that I know nothing and so that didn't work. So I did not watch the videos and um, I thought I would just go there and I'll see if glass can be used like 3D printing. Which really would have been the biggest loss in my artistic career if I would have moved forward with that. So these two objects were made in uh, four weeks of the artist residence. And they really show the, the, the complete failure of that approach. They're really nice objects and so, but they really are 12 years of basically making no progress when you compare them, because this is the same methodology. I take a bone that I find, I use a traditional method of casting by making a, a cast in silicon and then casting it off glass, making a mold, casting it in glass. It took very long. All these steps are incredibly time consuming, like making a mold text a day, having it dry text two days, blah, blah, blah. Everything is super, super time consuming. And for what, you ask yourself, to take the same form and just make it into a different shape, a different material. It doesn't seem to be really um, smart at all. So I even went to the, to the extent of then 3D scanning the glass part, uh, 3D modeling onto it, and then melting down the 3D, um, the 3D object into the glass cast. Again, two weeks off. Make the mold, burn out the mold. Blah, 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 blah. And in the end, when I look at them, I have not achieved anything else that I would have achieved here. Although now we have an emotional reaction to the material because, oh, that's glass, that's quite mild, which we maybe have not had here. So after a couple of days, I realized that, okay, we go through with it, that's fine, but end of days, that will not change my practice at all. That's like casting this well in gypsum or anything else, so why change my idea? But fortunately, and this was um, uh, Firak Soon was my was, was my assistant, but he was a uh, technical assistant. He was, he was actually much more knowledgeable than me. So he helped me doing this. And uh, but at the same time, there were these strange sessions that apparently artists and residents are supposed to do. <laughs> and what became afterwards the most valuable thing possibly given to me for me was at the beginning I thought that's a nuisance. That's nothing I want to do. And that was to work with glass blowers. But I had even no idea what to do. So here, here comes Tuesday at the beginning of the weekend. Here's your slot for working for five hours on in the hot shop with your two extremely skilled glass blowers. And I would think, oh, how much I do. Very bad idea. Because obviously, glass blowers are incredibly talented. They're very expensive as well. Working in a hot shop is incredibly expensive. I mean, even turning on the gas in a hot shop is also. So I had the, the pleasure of working with Sasha Pepper Stewart and Lisa Pioski for four weeks and very slowly, well first very slowly to get to know each other, we established a dialogue in making glass vessels that are very asymmetric and very much almost against traditional glass flowing based on an idea. And I thought I'd start very humble on mitosis where one single cell departs into two. So just this. So it's okay, we make one, and then we, we, we almost in, in time lapse look at like how a cell would split and make a uh, more complex organism rather than a single cell organism. And that's really tricky with glass So that was the summer in 2017. And, but from this moment onward, something magic happened that I realized 
my practice is completely atemporal and digital, or used to. So it means every step I did, and more or less everything you see on this table, has no time component in them. It's completely digital. So it's reproducible, it's digital. I tried with the crystals to make something unique out of the material, something that would have a different character. But with the glass glowing now, not as a material, but as a message, time became the absolute essence of the whole process. The time it takes to heat up the material, the time it takes to have the molten material on, scoop it out and rotate it, the time to inflate it, the time that it cools down before you cannot shape it anymore. Every step is incredibly time. Even the time of the day, let's say you have only eight hours, uh, or something like that, and there's other people on the slot that want to do stuff, so you have even to plan how much time it can take you to make that particular glass button. You, you're not finished at your, your uh, shift, so to say, then, well, the next person will take over, and you can start from scratch the next time, you, two days later, you have another one. So even then, once you're finished with the form, the shape that is inflated and, and twisted to the point that way I wanted it, it takes another two days for annealing it down, for cooling down the temperature. And then afterwards, the most amazing thing happened that I, I learned about the longevity of glass. So, and I, I was stunned to hear that if you throw away a glass bottle, at the time it would take to decay in nature is approximately one million years. So that's why you can still find glass that's very, very old and it's almost in the condition that we found it before. Maybe the surface is fresh, but the glass itself really takes long. But everything that I output here on this table, everything in this exhibition has not even a half life of 50 years. Or it's even uncharted territory of any of these 3D printed polymers, resins, calcites, can even stand 50 years. In fact, most of the technology is only 50 years old. So it was a really amazing moment to learn that one practice entirely time based. And every little thing in that second that you push it a bit, or float it a bit, or tweet it a bit, or cut it a bit, is the complete opposite of the other practice where time doesn't play any role in the making, but in the material, it's exactly the opposite. And since that time in 2017, I've been working with glass and pretty much on an ongoing basis, developing methods for how do you 3D scan it, how do you perfect the 3D scanning of it, because it's completely the opposite of what you should 3D scan. Scanning should not work on reflective objects or transparent objects, translucent objects, everything that glass is. Uh, ways of defining methods to attach to the glass, to balance glass, to balance the composition of its almost new type of stimulus. So it took, took a long time, but it started with a complete failure. Like, where I really thought, wow, that's 12 years and I have not progressed a single bit. When I looked at the object in the end, like two times bone, two times attachment, well, that did not add much. Apart from this, I click the mouse button and it's done. And this is three weeks of making time, purely on the various processes that I had to go through. So that, that was really uh, a moment. That's why I never did any glass casting afterwards. Yeah, but you learned about the glass glowing skill and you also brought the 3D printing to Pilchuck. So it was already during the presidency that you, you um, thought about the two. Yeah, as well. yeah. Uh, there's actually, I, um, it's kind of a shame that I can't show these images to the people in the room. Uh, I mean, they're not that, it would have been nice. So I. These are just some images. I actually, I can take this around. So these are some images of the residence where I was. Uh, this was the artist studio I was in there. And you see there is actually in the back a 3D printer and a 3D scanner. Those were already present in Kirchner, but largely due to Firak Soon, who was then my technical assistant, um, and is a, a really incredibly accomplished artist. Um, he brought in 3D printing of clay. And this idea was to be able to, for instance, well, 3D print something called a like glass pate, so to be able to 3D print something that you could fire afterwards into, in glass. And um, so there was, there was a, an emerging part of the School of Dutch where they wanted to inc incorporate more digital, so they had a little digital lab, particular for casting, so for printing it in 
polylactic acid with you, that is this one here, and then burning it out in the kiln so that you could have make a mold of it and cast it. And Fira really worked more into this idea of combining clay printing, ceramic printing, and glass, mm -hmm. uh, which he really has succeeded since then in these tools, and it's quite an amazing thing. Um, there's a couple of more images to that. This is the artist studio. The, I do have to obviously, uh, I learned a bit of glass blowing. So, um, I burned myself, which is quite normal apparently. It's very, very hot in here. Uh, it's really uncomfortable to work with glass. Uh, I enjoyed it and refused it. So like going to a furnace and opening a blast furnace from the back where all this hot air comes out is something you don't want to do. And I've never had the experience of not wanting to do something that I want to do. Like I said, like, I do want to do this glass blowing, but it's really like having a sunburn grade three on both of your arms. And particularly in future school, the, the furnace really blows the air out to the front. So it's really painful, but an amazing experience. So It's an architect learning to get his hands done. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it really was that. But because beforehand, these materials, even the crystal ones, they are very easy to handle. And these things, as you see, they are not, they are, they hate weirdly, they have gravity in there, they have an intention of what you can do with this, but not the sound, I mean, you, you can make scientific instruments out of glass, but not in this environment. Um, so it was really letting us, well, allowing a process of collaboration to take place. Mm -hmm. Because what I think glass blow is like tiny bubbles and a little bit of, it's not really that exciting. So being then able to draw on the floor, draw a lot of it by hand, actually, so a lot of these sketches, uh, a lot of the digital is pre predecessed by, by large hand drawings of the glass. Uh, so there, you see them actually on the background there. So the entire wall was covered with the drawings which were necessary to discuss things with the glass blower more. How can you do this? Why is it done this way? Then them saying this you can't do, or we try it. Like we can't do never happen. It was more like okay, let's try it, and then three hours passed by and the thing fell in the furnace. <coughs> we we'll tried again. Um, so yeah, this is amazing. This is an interesting image because here I really tried something that that is super novel, and it it works only once. It was the idea to fuse the polylactic acid material, which has a melting point of about 230 degrees Celsius, into the surface of the glass while it cools down. Um, a bit of physics behind it, when the glass cools down, it gets incredibly full of tension. And particularly when it's like in the lower 100 degrees, it gets really, 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 really tension. So it really, you don't want to even touch it with a tiny bit. Because it really, the, the, the tension in the, in the material gets very, very strong. So that can as well explode. That way you have to cool it down really, really slow. So basically, a touching a 3D print on 240 degrees is the dumbest idea possible. And it often leads to the thing exploding. And that's very dangerous as well. So there you see me basically, this is one of the broken experiments on the floor where we are now 175 degrees. So it was trying to fuse the polylactic acid really into it. So I thought if I'd be able to intersect in the process of the glass cooling down, that would be an amazing achievement. Later I thought that that was maybe a bit insane because now all the works actually are balancing or are held in the tension of the material. They don't need to be juiced anymore. But at that time I really thought this would be an amazing achievement. But it, it failed almost every time we tried so <laughs> You can't actually work against the material. It's very tricky. Altogether though, the glass experiments there mm. Um, taught you a lot of new skills and acquainted you with a different craft. But also I think it's, it's fair to say that they made you instantly a little bit famous in the glass world. Um, I must maybe say that before I came to Hong Kong, I worked in a, in a glass museum also in North America um, before you did these experiments, but I was, I was very familiar with contemporary glass making and especially also with the Northwest region. So in Washington state, in where Seattle is the, the, the best known city, around uh, the city of Tacoma, more than 200 glass artists 
settled, including Dave Shabuli, um, Dante Marioni, some of the very famous um, American glass artists, and some, as you said, in, initiated the Pilchard workshop. But they also, in that community, developed a glass museum in Tacoma that is, is very well known now and hugely supported, as you can imagine, by the community. And this is where you basically went next in, in the glass community as the best of the best uh, glass artists do. So your shift, I'm very complimentary, right? Yeah, yeah, your yeah, shift yeah, yeah. was very fast. Glass, always <laughs> was very fast though in being extremely instrumental to um, having been given a second chance and an and experimental phase, or maybe less experimental, but hmm. art phase at Tacoma. Uh, okay, I mean, I am, in comparison to the people that I worked with there, uh, I would be very humble. And I, I am very humble because I'm by no chance on any of their levels. I came with some ideas and some really turned out well. And the community there is incredibly supportive. So from the director, Tina Fieri, um, from actually a, a Amy McNeil and her husband, uh, Mark Zirko, who somehow in the background were able to promote what I was doing. And I'm really thankful and grateful. So that the Tacoma Museum of Glass Right after the museum, right after the residence in Pilcher, um, allowed me to have four days with them. Now that doesn't sound just feel like okay. I was four four weeks in Pilcher and four days in in Tacoma. That seems to be <laughs> out of proportion, but it's the opposite. Um, Tacoma is uh, a very wonderful museum that is around a, a tipi structure, kind of like of a, a hot shop, which has absolute incredibly amount of, of wonderful facilities so and to be able to for four days work with a full team like of glass blowers and cold workers and the whole thing i mean if you even do the simple math you're going to like 50 60 thousand us dollars in pure cost for that so even an hour is, is already like incredibly generous and these are glass blowers that work every day around this around the year in this museum working either with the best of the best of the best worldwide that get actually invited to do three hours, four hours in their workshop, which is public accessible. So it's a huge public seating area, and then you have the, the floor, and then you have all the ovens and everything. So their team knows everything from working with the Hilltop Artists community with like the high school kids to make uh, really uh, Strange drawing into glass objects to working with worldwide famous uh, glass models. So having their time was was just amazing, and we could do some of the very complex glass making that we were not able to do in Pilcher purely because well I had not that much time with, for instance, Sasha and Pierre. Sometimes it took more hours to actually get certain things and put them then together. And as well, like, of course, it's, it's, it's just the facility is, is incredible. And so it was very, I was very humble to be allowed to do this. And again, we only, tr we tried to do the cell mitosis, but then with three uh, cell parts. So some of the work in glass mutation was done there, for instance. Um, there's those six volumes that kind of come together for which you really need to have four different glass pieces come together and then the whole team basically having to somehow make sure that all of this locks into each other and then somehow gets somehow gets safely to the minimum. <laughs> um, those those things were quite uh, amazing. So I, I I don't think I play a big role in the glass world. I just came to the right time and I brought some ideas that were fascinating enough or different enough to actually have a really, really good time with them. They were very, very, very young. Uh, encouraging and, and incredibly complimentary. Mm -hmm. So I supported afterwards, of course, whenever I could the museum. Um, I still owe them a glassware, which I want to bring <laughs> to America, and I hope they are listening now. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that we have that agreement, and I am I'm, I'm taking that agreement serious. I'm bringing it <laughs> after the COVID 19 is over. And um, 
Yeah. It set you up on a good path. Oh, it did. And I came back the year after to work actually with some of the people that I met then in Kirchhoff uh, and at the museum. In the museum, I worked with a team around Ben Kopp, who was there, an incredibly talented glass blower, uh, and his team of Sarah Gilbert and Dave Fan. Um, and I met uh, some of the glass blowers at the Kirchhoff, like uh, Jason Christian and Dale, and um, we, and a year later, I came back. And then some of the large volumes that you see in the, in the other room, those in the, the white, really large ones, heavy ones, we really had, uh, we only produced six of them during two days, and that was with Jason and his team, and it was uh, uh, Nick. It was incredibly humbling to work with them as well. But that was, so I came back. Mm -hmm. But since then, since 2018, I've actually I had not the chance to go back. I produced so much, uh, about three cubic meters during those two things, um, that I still, well, I now only have the time to actually develop all the kinds of equipment. Um, so now it's, it's one point it will be time to go back. <laughs> yeah, so many of the objects that you um, worked on, the glass objects you worked on, mm -hmm. both in Pinchak and Takuma, they are now included in the exhibition here and in many of the um, are mounted with mm -hmm. the 3D resin. But this isn't, this is maybe your, your largest, the largest exhibition, yeah. and, but it's not the first. So we no. since the Tacoma experience, you've done, you had individual pieces or groups yeah. of pieces I did. in other exhibitions. Yeah, when I came to Hong Kong, the practice really shifted. So from being an architect who's kind of like doing some uh, interesting experience here and there to being uh, a full time assistant professor, now associate professor in the School of Creative Media. I came to the School of Creative Media because it was such an incredible, diverse faculty, and I still very strongly believe in it. And it became a catalyst to my work. So, in the six years being here, I had to maybe document whatever I've been doing in the last six years in order to achieve as well the associate professor promotion. So I had to document it down. There was over 70 exhibitions, that's seven zero, on four continents. So that was quite um, a lot. And the results of the Tacoma and Pilcher Glass School, they were featured in Sigurd's best art paper in 2018, which then made that approach to the academic community quite valid. Uh, in, for instance, in Australia, in the science, um, uh, science gallery, this, uh, together with Jane Profit, where we filled one of what you're seeing on the screen is as well the, the first uh, one of the Tacoma work, as it works, and the glass mutation. And the second one of them we actually filled with, uh, together with Jane Profit and Victor Lang, with uh, chemicals and mounted it on a kinetic installation that very softly basically swung them around. So I worked with the glass in kinetics. I worked with the glass uh, in the young, uh, young Chinese media artists on the road 2019. Um, then in the Goethe Institute. So there was a number of, 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 of exhibitions where I really had the chance to work with the glass and incorporate it as well to the other parts of my practice. Never as extensive as here in Munich, that's the first. But speaking about integrating it, it also gave you the opportunity to really showcase how traditional craftsmanship and digital craftsmanship come together. And it, it looks at the resin material in a different way, right? Mm. Your ambition and, and the proof you deliver for that by now to, in a way, to elevate uh, printed resin to an acknowledged material for sculpting and, and in sculpture. And it's also something that accompanied you on your path for a while. I mean, after Pilchuk and after that idea of, okay, maybe there is a bridge to, to construct between traditional, more traditional forms of making. That's, that says by no way that a glass maker's traditional craftsmen. Mm -hmm. okay? They're very experimenting with chemicals and colors and ways of making. And I remember one artist uh, in Pilcher, she, she actually made sculptures by, by taking Cassie, she's a, a beautiful, wonderful Australian artist, by hugging pill with, with big pillows, hugging big inflated piece of glass. And as I told you, it's like, it's <laughs> extremely painful to even think about, but her 
like a mother's heart hugging with this inflated glass, why does he send me off? So they are very creative, definitely not very traditional. Um, but uh, I, I took that then and I thought, okay, let's see if we can claim this bridge and extend it. So I then wrote my, almost my entire PhD about the idea of what the digital craftsmanship could be. So with, with, uh, with the supervisor of RMIT, Simon Helso, we really pushed this idea of like, what is the digital craftsmanship? How do we take certain elements from traditional class and craftsmanship? Not only glass, I mean, I collaborated with fashion designers and jewelry designers, now with ceramic artists and the ceramic works of your of the collection of the humor. Mm -hmm. how, how can you not imitate but transfer methods sometimes, sometimes materials? So in, in the I with the dresses as well as transferring Irish crocheting techniques to 3D printing with the work with you it is largely to do with developing an idea about new types of blazes and even the idea of looking at 4,000 years of Chinese ceramics and the ingenuity, how they came up continuously with new types of blazing, how do we bring this to 3D printing or to the surface? So, um, yeah, that emerging discipline, hopefully, with digital craftsmanship is just one that, yeah, without printing, I don't think I would have actually, mm -hmm. without being introduced to that intense intensity of making a glass, I would have not actually gone that far. Yeah. Maybe to say a word or two uh, more on, on our um, earlier collaboration, ongoing collaboration, in, in fact, it's, it's really the idea to introduce um, to be as a students who are obviously working with him on contemporary um, designs and materials and techniques, to introduce them to traditional techniques and materials. Um, we do sessions here at the museum where we start with Neolithic ceramics and study in the classroom with the, the historic objects um, basically four or five thousand years of ceramic making in China, different materials, different techniques, different glazes to introduce the students, your students, to a different, to an earlier way of making ceramic vessels, for example. Mm -hmm. And then going from there with, um, we scan some of the objects, so we allow the students in a way to work with the shape, but then obviously take all this into the 21st century um, and work in, in, in resin and in printed uh, materials. Um, Tobias just changed the screen to show some of the blue and white um, objects that are actually in the vitrine here. You see the screen there, but then they are also there. In the exhibition here, we juxtapose them with Chinese ceramics, but they are really our teaching materials and, and the origin of this investigation. Yeah. It's uh, ongoing and it's, it's something that is very um, dear to me to be able to work more with ceramics as well. So uh, at the moment we're still working on the surface level. Um, and through 3D scanning, what I showed you the glass, we scanned as well quite a few objects in the end now. So the idea in, in the classroom really is to uh, expose mostly postgraduate students. Um, most uh, to 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 that miracle thing that I couldn't believe really first. When you look actually at some of the ceramics in the museum, you feel like, well, that's kind of like 50 or 100 years old or something like that. And the pattern, for instance, uh, seems to be fairly modern. And then you read the, the age tag, as they call it, <laughs> and it's like 2,000 years old. Uh, so there is something quite humbling when realizing that certain ornaments and patterns are actually less contemporary than you really think they are. Um, and that, in the last few years, in the two iterations that we had, that really has led to quite a lot of students um, becoming really fascinated with, for instance, the type of floral arrangements, what actually flowers are there, what kind of fish were really, there, how do you think peel off the fish that were painted on and becoming actually mm -hmm. 3D printing the, the fish pole that was moving. Uh, 
asymmetry in the hybridized certain ornamental spines, the Rococo, if you know, the Rigi, with some of the two figures, which was quite an, yeah. an insane gap of jumping back and forth in time. Um, but that kind of hybridization uh, is interesting and it's exciting. Most of my students is obviously as well their cultural heritage that they are actually sometimes faced for the first time and getting actually very surprised about what is there and how to what could possibly be a factor of bringing that into contemporary art, contemporary ways of publication. Um, so it's ongoing and it's very exciting. Very exciting. I hope as well that we can one day cross it uh, potentially between the glass and the ceramics. It would be quite exciting to yeah. see where we can do this. So there's still a lot of room for exploration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Two years ago, compared to the 4,000 years. <laughs> that brings me to my last question, and then we open this up to, to all of you, both in the room and, and, and certainly online. Um, you, we spoke a, a little bit about our collaboration and also the, the teaching we do with students, but can you speak a little bit about maybe the collaboration that you do with other artists sure. and maybe future projects, yeah. something we can get excited about? Right. So, uh, whew, let me just down. So I, I have been collaborating with designers and craftsmen fashion designers, for example, is Alexander Buren. And just two days ago, we had a talk with the Hong Kong Fashion Council, the Tech Fashion Council. Fashion, textile, and woolen, it has a very long name. Um, and about the idea of a future design research institute on that. Um, I've been working with Sylvia Weidenbach, who is a jewelry designer, a uh, jewelry maker. And that was super exciting to actually work for the first time with somebody who works with her hands and the idea of metal and things and hammering and silversmithing and how our collaboration changed her practice in life. I learned a lot about the problems of symmetry and she learned a lot about the, the, that, well, she actually inspired me first to think that 3D printed material could be an actual material. Because for jewelry, you learn all kinds of materials can be actual. At the moment, I work a lot more with scientists. So, material scientist, uh, chemist, Professor Lam, from Sibiu, when, when we developed together with Stick Your Lang, a robotic architectural background, uh, methods and tools for uh, coating the 3D prints to be susceptible to laser light. So, how do we do glazes from plastic? Because obviously, you would take a glaze from ceramic glazing and you apply it to fire, and yeah, your plastic would melt in a second. So how do we take that idea of chemical uh, change in a material due to temperature and put it into a material that cannot understand temperature? So in that case, we need cold uh, UV light and uh, cyanotypes and gelatin-based suspension. So it's a lot more about now collaborating as well with so scientists of different environmental areas and cities. Um, I do work together with Jane Prophet, Professor Jane Prophet from the University of Michigan. She was maybe the most uh, uh, amazing, she is the most amazing person in that we have met in 2013 and realized that we almost did, to some degree, in some materials, an identical artistic practice without ever knowing from each other. She 3D printed a half, I 3D printed a half. She grew crystals, I grew crystals. Like it was actually a very eerie moment in realizing that you have almost a doppelganger without ever having met your doppelganger or heard of the word of each other. That was quite a strong moment. So we're working, we work on the bloodworks again with Victor Learn together, and we are working at the moment for an exhibition in November of art machines. So we'll see where that takes us. And um, so Victor Learn is, is quite amazing to work with. There's a, a a wonderful new faculty as well, Alvaro Casinelli, who I started to work on, work with, and uh, let's see where that goes. He's a computer science background uh, in uh, high speed photonics, high speed photonic projection, I think, which is what I dabbled around with when trying to tell the crystals where to go and where not to go by projection mapping onto the material. And then um, I still hope to go back to the shop, which you uh, said this week. Soon, uh, the travel management 
and uh, African speaker is Joseph uh, Rosano, uh, one of the really, really, really great makers in the, in the Chihuly team, uh, guy who made the giant table in the boathouse, an incredibly established artist as well and environmental activist. He as well helped to or allowed him to introduce me and um, facilitate and made it happen that we have the silver glass for us. So I didn't know how it worked. And, uh, Joseph is working along the silver in the field. So there's a bunch of wonderful people I, I want to continue working with, and some I do. Very international crowd. Yeah, well, once travel bands are listed, <laughs> many of them <laughs> At the moment, it's all a bit. Um, are there any yeah. questions in the room? Yes. I'm interested in the, the instrument that you used to make an object like this, for example. It's originally made for making what? It's not made for making art objects, right? Like the, the, in, the instrument or whatever. What is it developed for? So the, the printer. Uh, yeah. The printer. Well, what is the most yeah. common use of this instrument? What do the printers print it's, more? It's it's not, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really funny because mm -hmm. I, I went twice to the Shenzhen factory. Now it's all one and I'm just spending days and going back. But to go there and to actually see how the facility, what do they do, how does it look, how. And um, okay, maybe I have to go back to this. When I started this whole happiness day in some 3D printing, 2004, there was one place in London called Rapid Farm, which was the former clay shed at the Royal College of Art. In there was a guy sitting who was called Martin Walmart. And if you went there, and you had a couple of machines, and you went there with anything, you saw everything. You saw archaeology people, you saw Formula One, because they were able to print in uh, titanium. You saw, I mean, there was, like, in this machine, every day was some other stuff. From completely unrelated other stuff. So you went there, you sat down and wait for your friend, because you said, oh, come and pick it up, and you would meet somebody from any weird industry, like industrial design, product design, archaeology, that's a lot of archaeology, theology, um, the, the whole car manufacturing industry was sitting there waiting for the little titanium prints of prototypes. So that was really amazing. Now, in terms of, I didn't feel that it's that diverse anymore. So these machines, because they are fairly large scale, um, I actually really don't know what's the one that is mostly printed. There used to be some more car parts, for instance, used to be printed actually by a bit of them. But by now it's a hopscotch of everything because it's so ridiculous. I mean, even if anything that you could use in less than 5,000 times the quality, it becomes economically actually I mean, that's a very wild definition. Um, it becomes economically more viable to 3D print it than to do an injection. So. Because you said that most of these objects uh, are not aging longer than 50 years or have a life of about 50 years. But I understand if you can make all kinds of um, pieces for industry, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. these industries would also be interested to make more durable, uh, mm -hmm. less terrain material. Not Depending on what they use for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's this, this problem with the washing machine. If the washing machine oh, breaks so down so after one just year just and one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's, that's the idea. I mean, from the industry point of view, where I see it being. I mean, look, this, one that I see a lot in the Shenzhen is actually trophies. And trophies nobody cares for. Oh, my God. A lot. And big mm -hmm. trophies. We're talking about crazy trophies. So there's <laughs> a lot of those. You see a lot of small parts for prototypes, let's say um, customized keychain rings or whatever. And that doesn't need to last that long, and it needs to be cheap as well. So a lot of these small batch mass customized elements are in there. And the tanks that is for the most common called uh, selective, no, uh, um, stereolithography apparatus or the resin with the UV light curing. The tanks are about 600, 600 by 500 million, which is fairly big. But that doesn't mean that you put big things in there. That means you stack uh, thousands of things in there, run the whole batch, then take it out, clean it all up, and do it for the various clients. So mm -hmm. um, it can be very small stuff, so it doesn't have to be big stuff. In fact, small stuff usually, 
it's more uh, uh, the companies are much more happy to use lots of small than some big because of course when there's a failure they have to start the whole thing again and not a lot of time and material. So I would really be, it would be difficult for me to say who is playing the most for this money. It is well a very business to business industry by now. So you have offices that only produce that say yeah uh, USB covers all you need for the first 5,000 access of China Airways or whatever. And then that business gets distributed to first the design company and then to the Shenzhen printing company. So what in the end ends up at each of the Shenzhen competing companies is quite quite difficult to say. I didn't feel that it's one dominant. And usually by now, car industries for their prototype development, they actually go to separate rooms because obviously one car company should never see what the other car company does. So <laughs> those you can't see anymore. I remember in the beginning of the early days, it was really like there's a big, like 50 by 40 industrial meters hall, and then you have one printer next to the other, one printer next to the other, and then little 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 room dividers where you would have the cars of car companies. They have then their own separate doors. So that VW should not see what BMW does or vice versa. That used to be quite fun. But even that is fun. We have one question um, online, and before I take yours, from Sunny Wang, who herself is a very established glass artist in Hong Kong at ABA um, at Baptist University. And she asked about how you combine the glass and the 3D printing, the blown bubble in this case. Does the glass come first mm. or the printed resin comes first? So, um, great question, Sunny. It would be amazing mm. if the 3D print could come first. That would take a lot of my time and head away, but unfortunately it's exactly the other way around. So I have to come up with an idea that idea I need to communicate with the glass blowers to make the glass. Then all the cold work I've actually done, so all the cutting and grinding and polishing I've done myself. Um, because it's very actually very pleasing. And uh, then I have to coat the works with something that is takes away the reflective sheen, but still can be perfectly removed. Then I 3D scan the glass so I get a digital copy of the glass. But remember, some of them are bubbles, so it's very different. You can't see what's inside them because you only get a, a mesh. So you don't know. So you have to really then wrap your head around what it is, what you're actually looking at. Scan. So you get a, a mesh just from the outer surface, not from what's inside. And obviously, if it has deep creases and other things, then you get a blob. So you get a fragmented digital skin of that glass. That you then somehow digitally have to orient where it's up and where it's down, where does it fall over and where does it not fall over. So these are very, it sounds very simple, but it's actually quite tricky because you have to, and never feel it. You cannot feel it with your hand. Oh, here it balances like this. No, no, no. It's not, that is gone. And then based on this fragmented territory, 3D really standing patches, let's say, I start to weave or work around and start to build up the, the 3D printed part. So the 3D print comes after, and it's sadly always only on a very fragmented level from the original glass. I mean, obviously, sometimes I put the glass next to my computer so I can look somehow, okay, this looks like that, this is that, and it might, might be right. As a side note, I was incredibly surprised how little failure rate we had in this exhibition, because I really thought this is gonna be a very dangerous way of working, because I'm not simulating so I don't run calculation of where is the balance for this. I'm just, ah, that should work. So I thought it would not work. And I thought it worked because the method of stretching the 3D print really, really with my full force pressing the 3D print into the glass, like that it snaps over some of these glass nodules that you see there in the big finger. I saw as well the 3D print would snap a lot easier. But somehow with 15 years of experience, it seemed to be that I got away with no breakage and only one really wobbling part where I had to do a bit of work on the train to stop So, yeah, the 3D print from second. We have another question here. Uh, yeah, so I saw at MIT they made a 3D glass, glass printer. printer right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was really exciting to see. And I yeah. see a lot of potential for this type of work with yeah. that. And uh, I'm just curious what you 
you see is like the timeline for uh, more technology like that being developed and then being able to utilize and then you know, commercial incentives. Of, yeah. Yeah. So the, the question um, in the room, I just say this to the yeah. microphone, um, is about the development of 3D printing. MIT has put out a glass 3D printer. And so you ask uh, to hear about the developments in that technology, not just glass related, but in general, I assume. Yeah, well, material science is generally yeah. exciting, mm -hmm. but like yeah. specifically like- Specifically so glass. Data and yeah. More, like, accessible. Um, the glass 3D printer, it was a, a running gag between me and Victor because a year later we built, largely Victor built, a 3D sugar printer that uses exactly the same mechanisms than the glass printer for about one percentile of the price. The results are the same as well, apart from that they are sugar. So the glass printer is a gravity fed printer. It means you open a nozzle and the glass runs out. And so then you move it around, and that's quite cool. We did the same as molten sugar, which literally is the same. You just heat up the sugar, and you have to control the flow rate and the viscosity, so how it can get up. And you can eat it. Yes. <laughs> that was actually not, and the ants could eat it as well. <laughs> um, now, the problem is that with that, that you, and that's the same as like when you scale things up in architectural context, if you have a nozzle to which you squeeze something or let it just run out, then you have a very limited geometry that you can actually build. Because if you think that a 3D printing always builds up, up and down or down or up, or it basically does it in that direction, then if you start with a layer that is like this, right, and then you end up with this size, then all of this is not supported. So it will just fall down because you can't just print in air with these type of fuse deposition modeling or gravity type modeling. So whether it's clay or molten glass or molten sugar or all of these, they cannot do the level of inclination or the degree of inclination cannot go too flat. And I haven't seen anything in glass that excites me in that terms of in terms of 3D printing for the near future at all. Full stop. What I have seen is in ceramics. In ceramics, the whole game is now changing. Why so? It's not only changing because of. Um, so, this is a gypsum powder, and some research has been done that if you change the gypsum to basically ceramic, kind where there is ceramic uh, calcite, and you bind it with the resin, you would be able to fire it. Of course, with great shrinkage rates, but still. So, that has been done. The results are okay ish. What got super excited is when people started to mix the ceramic particles with resin. So with the high precision resin printer like these ones. And um, there was a, a lot of commercial companies like Shapeweight and others who started with like, oh, print your own luck, which usually was more like an investment card. And all of a sudden, all of these stopped to exist about last year. So, my hunch now is because when I saw these grassroots companies, Keithon and uh, the little desktop printer companies that started to bring out mixtures of that resin, resin ceramic, that then disappeared as well. So my hunch is that now that we have quite large companies getting involved in 3D printing, like HP, for instance, Canon, even Apple is actually working on their own 3D printing, that the ceramic comes back and that somebody has basically reached that. We're all working on something, so that's why a lot of companies stop even offering the product. Because let's be honest, if you're able to make that in ceramic and fire it, I mean, why would you ever really trust it? Right? Uh, and I've seen some of the samples, they're quite amazing, because you can go to like 0.5 millimeter thick ceramic elements after burning, and that's, that's I mean, you can't do that in any time. So that, that's, I think, is more where the future of materials and 3D printing in that scale lies. Of course, then there's a whole building of the sites which everybody seems to hold great to somehow 3D print buildings, which I think is not. We have another question online that relates to size and proportion. Um, asking, as your scale is increasing, certainly the part-to-part -part relationship with print comes into play. But where are the limitations on the size of the glass? 
So the physical limitation mm. of blowing out these large bubbles mm. that I think um, in the exhibition for people who are here, they can see that some of the limitations are probably reached with mm. the last pieces yeah, with, yeah, the yeah. White, with the white resin. I mean, with the glass, is um, the limitation is obviously the oven, the furnace, and the doors to the furnace, and the annealing. I mean, literally, the, the super practical sense. It's like you want to do large glass, you have to have a seriously large furnace, and you have to have a large oven, and you have to for heating it up, and you have to have a large annealing place for cooling it down. Those are the first level of limitations, and the second level is that you have to have the muscles. To actually lift the glass up and carry it around. And there's not many people who are doing it. I mean, like some of the glass bars that did those bubbles are really well built, heavy guys, like seriously strong people. There's, of course, all kind of tricks, like you have know, supports and all that kind of stuff, but still, it's actually quite heavy. I mean, lifting the, the sculpture in the other room with the two bubbles is about 26 kilos of glass. So it's, it's not really the easiest game of moving it around. So I don't think I will have much larger glass doors to be honest. Now the part to part what Ryan is asking, sure, that's getting now the interesting bit if the glass is combined, which happened in the in the work coexistence three, that I'm actually combining multiple glass volumes now together. Mm -hmm. It would be quite amazing thinking about David Shihuli style mm -hmm. and getting it even bigger and combining them to bigger structures. There is a limitation that that in Hong Kong, there are some amazing glass facilities, um, but by no means to the size scale of changing that, uh, and as well the economy of doing it. So mm -hmm. that I think would require me to go to, for instance, Pacific Northwest for a couple of months and really working on bigger pieces. He's really working on that next fellowship, if you can. Yeah. You listen to very carefully. Um, I have one related question maybe, to, the, to the resin. I know that some yeah. of your objects are put together like the vessel of yeah. from separately printed mm. pieces, but are there limitations again? I mean, the furnace mm. and the furnace door, mm. the, the strength of the gaffer is a limitation, but with the printing, how big are the printer? Well, huge. Yeah, no, no, I mean, see, there, there's the problem with the glass and the 3D print there. So if you look at a lot of modern design furniture, ones, like really crazy ones, yeah, like organic, blah, blah, blah. a lot of them actually are 3D printed, but within very thin shells, like all point, like a millimeter strong shells, and then they get stitched together and a little bit of sandpapering. And then investment cast, for instance, involved. So you can get very large bronze casts, like Northern Italy, for instance, China as well, lots of America, that are based initially on 3D print. Even quite a lot of bigger sculptures in terms of uh, like Anthony Quinn, Mark Mark Quinn, for instance, and his his uh, his yoga sculptures and all that, human side, that was 3D printed, 100% 3D printed and then cast. So because the 3D print gets cheap when you don't use much material. So if you use thin shell structures, like just the, just the skin, put it all together and then invest in cast the whole thing, you can actually achieve quite large scale. There is obviously architects who make pavilions out of usually 2D material because it's cheap, that 3D. But if you work like a little under check, for instance, they make little spatial things and basically put them together. And then you can get as well quite large, like three, four, five meters or so. Mm -hmm. Um, but individual prints, like one print having this done, I would say 500, 500 by 600 is where you commercially reach the end. There is nothing bigger than that, unless you obviously go to some more experimental printers. So you can have the clay printers that do clay things that are very big, even the size of a house big, but there's a limitation of the surface and the kind of not falling down. Or there's in that type of quality resin, there's only one that I'm aware of in Belgium, which is about two by one by one meter. Uh, it's called actually the Mammoth print. <laughs> it's a very, this, this technology, the SLA, is very old. So you have to remember this is old and very reliable. So people and companies are more happy with playing with this in bigger scale. 
And if you want to do anything with SLS, that doesn't even exist. Plus, with this, this is a this is a cold material, so it never gets heated up. So it has a lot less problems with heat deformation by the large pieces. While these are all selective laser sintered, so when the part gets too big, it is already in an oven, then the heat transfer in the object actually will make it warp during the printing process. So if you get it too, too big, it's just basically mm -hmm. not going to come out the way. And the failure rate gets very, very high. So and then the cost involved gets very high. So people don't. Yeah. Speaking about shapes and forms, uh, Sunny sent in another question asking about the inspirations that behind the organic shapes that you created around the glass bubbles, mm. so the 3D printed. Mm. Well, I mean, in this vitrine, um, I laid down a little bit the, the truth, mm -hmm. so where stuff comes from. And there is a lot of the very old drawings of Ernst Haeckel, uh, who is a kind of mad genius between various chairs, and who drew a lot of the art forms of nature. So a lot of the inspiration for these symmetries, pseudo-symmetries, twisted ideas, I mean, twisted forms, come actually from looking at um, his work on radiolaras, uh, tiny organisms, structures, calcites, uh, calcified structures in the ocean, um, on one hand. The, there is um, a couple of other inspirations. One is the MRI scanning of my own body. So a lot of these uh, on the wall there you see actually the print of my left and right lung. So these are like 3D x-rays. And quite a bit of those find actually their ways into the works in front of you. So sometimes those are what was once the found element of the, the turtle is now the found digital object of let's say uh, the coronary arteries on my heart, or the, the, the lung tapeas, or other parts that become actually foundations. Sometimes I model really with them, and sometimes they're just inspiration. Uh, found spaces, found organic matter, or digital organic matter. Um, yeah, I think those are, those are really where it comes from. Um, there's something that I always assume that everybody knows, and then people are quite often surprised. When I say it loud, nothing in this exhibition follows any algorithm. So nothing is scripted, nothing is programmed, nothing is coded, nothing is uh, somehow with attractors or agent system or agent based modeling. Nothing has a logic that is based on making it into a computational systematic. All of this is basically modeled by hand as if it would be sculpted. In just that I don't use a spatula and a knife, but uh, a mouse. So that's maybe a very weird moment because in a way it makes me very old fashioned or very, very different because usually one would think, why is he not running some agent based thing that does not get in some way? But that's maybe the strength that was started with this facade. But uh, the question then in architecture that everybody got their head puzzles about it, like, why is it? Is it, is it not symmetrical? Like, why does he start with a facade that is totally symmetrical and then everything on there looks a bit symmetrical, but it's not? It's not, why is he not mirroring? It's the simplest command with any 3D software, just mirror. So, why is it not? And it's because if I would have mirrored it, it wouldn't make any sense to me to actually sculpt it onto that. It's that moment that I started from the bottom, set certain attractor points, and then started to grow it together. So it means that every step is actually a decision, and not anymore just one mirror to the second and then double that. Uh, yeah. So that was a very puzzling moment for the then in the 90s, super, uh, well, 2000, um, the architecture community that was very, very into like a new type of computational algorithms, happiness. And then comes one guy along and goes, well, there's nothing new. We have one question that loosely relates to that, and that is Sunny asking again is there some sort of handheld 3D printing to create the organic shapes that you have directly I've, I put that in onto the glass bubble? I think this relates to a sort of a direct application of print to glass. There is um, my colleague in CPU, Dr. Turning Zhu, 
uh, and a couple of other computer scientists have done a bit of, or not a good amount of research on 3D printing on existing objects. And if you have an existing object, and how does that object get recognized and then printed onto that object? And to my knowledge, and I have to make a disclaimer here that I have not followed the scientific community on that, it's very tedious and it's not easy and the result of by far not on commercial grade at this point in time. So the kind of like complexity achievable by even get because it's not a 3D scanning, it's basically a kind of recognizing that something is in the resin tank and you're mm -hmm. supposed to print onto that what is there. It's a fairly difficult, complex back and forth. But if you're interested, like Kirby and you has written about it, published about it, and uh, I remember this office being full of resin, it was very fun and I was very, very excited because I got this thought as well like, wow, this is amazing. Just imagine you break something and you got the shape and you put it in the 3D printer and it prints back what is broken. How cool is that? Um, but so far, I'm not entirely sure about that. But it's that well, but I have, again, this claim I have not followed it for about two, one and a half years, which is a, an eternity in research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> might be that it's probably possible already. But for Sunny, I have not seen a commercial viable printer that could print directly onto glass. It always has the problem of that you need to dull the surface of the glass and then scan it and then be able to attach what you print onto it. Uh, and uh, the way how I attach it is I use these glass nodules so that I put this really printed material almost stretching it over and under tension. If you not do that, then you have to find some way of adhesive or balance. Some of the work I've done. Um, but if not, then you have to find an adhesive. And glass and polymers are not really that friendly. Thank you. Are there any more questions here in the room? Yes. Uh, you can probably explain by the first lecture because you speak on the crystal uh, yeah. process. The, the process used to make this. Um, crystal growing is uh, really simple. Uh, most of them are super toxic and you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. There's two or three that are not too toxic. Uh, salt and sugar, obviously, uh, I exclude them because they are way really too easy. Uh, aluminium, potassium sulfate, and um, oh, what's the blue again? Copper, copper sulfates. Although copper sulfates are really inhibiting your self healing. So if you cut yourself with copper sulfate, it, it takes weeks to actually heal. Um, they both can be grown in uh, two ways. Uh, the most common one is a super saturated fluid. Um, so you create a water to the boiling point and you add as much material as possible. Uh, so the capacity of fluids to have material dissolved in them increases when you increase the temperature. Now, we all know this because you put sugar in your tea. I mean, I don't, but maybe some of you. I mean, actually, sugar in tea is horrible. But you know what I mean. You put sugar in a warm beverage and it dissolves. You put the same amount of sugar in a cold beverage and you can't dissolve it unless you got the, the sugar syrup that you get in Hong Kong sometimes with a cold lemon tea. Um, if you're taking your hot tea and you throw it against the wall, you shouldn't do that at home, you get micro crystals. They feel like stickiness. They're actually micro crystals. If you put a thread into your tea, like a cotton thread, okay, and you keep the tea nice and warm and you come back and you drop the temperature really slow, you will get one big sugar crystal in the end again on your thread because the crystal likes the nucleation basically around a natural fiber material or porosity material. And dropping the temperature means that the excess sugar or crystal needs to go somewhere. And either it drops to the floor of your cup or it attaches to something. Now, here the hypothesis is if I have a porous material, so this is a, a synthetic material that the laser synthesis polymer particles, so it actually feels as though it's porous, like a bit like sandpaper. Then, because I tested about 30 crystals and I think eight different 3D printing materials, this one came out as being by far the best one for making that target. The idea in these works was then that I wanted to direct where the crystal grows and where not. Of course, that's the same idea because it's in a 
water mass, and it's full of entropic states that are mixing like hot and cold and blah, blah. But I thought maybe if I take a very strong projector and I project the black and white pattern onto it through the glass, through the water, and the radius could be. Then maybe I could say where it goes more and where it goes less. Maybe I could at least influence. Because when you actually look into the, and there's a, a very famous uh, German writing about growing crystals, the art and science of growing crystals, you'll see that even the tiniest, minute, and insane little environmental factors are disturbing where a crystal starts nesting and where it doesn't. I mean, that goes as far as people playing Beethoven music or whatever when they grow crystals. <laughs> this is a whole, there's a whole big world field of nerds out there who want to grow the biggest, clearest, perfect crystal. We talk about like half a meter crystal in laboratories or so, like very slow and all that. So I only thought maybe I can try to juxtapose the super precise medical with the influence. The influence being black and white patterns changing the surface temperature minutely. It's definitely not scientific correct work. Uh, I would say it's an empirical trying that I've been for about two years with crystals. Uh, I achieved that I can really clearly grow crystals into 3D printed material, into SLS material, and thus the artwork in the third room, the crystal bodywork, really took the environmental data of the gallery with sensors and heated up the water accordingly to how much presence was in the room. And so I could actually either grow very big crystals or tiny crystals. But I still have achieved to grow a crystal precisely on one point in the 3D plan, which is kind of fun. Maybe bigger projectors. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tobias. Um, I, I think we we'll close it here. I thank you all for coming. Um, you here in the gallery, um, our online community, thank you for your questions. Um, we started introducing the exhibition a little bit more and talking about glass. Mm -hmm. um, I wish you well, go home, play Beethoven, grow some crystals, and mm -hmm. most importantly, stay healthy. And we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>